Hey guys, Rob from Georgia here with you, aka VHS82 Apostrophe, and a quick introduction that will serve for each and every one of these 10 segments that will make really make up my top 100 personal top 100 films of all time. It is a huge overhaul, it is a revamp, it is a is a relook at the entire thing. And eventually at the end of this thing, I am gonna do a letterbox version of this, which you know hopefully will make the first letterbox when I did years ago look pale in comparison. Uh, so really this is my top top 100 personal 100 films. Things that have influenced me from the earliest of my days. I was born in 70. Uh, man, the decade of the 80s was, man, I mean, VHS video stores, the drive-in circuit, all of that stuff. And of recent, becoming a collector, 22 Shots of Moods and Horror, uh, podcasts, uh, body bags, uh, just all my influences, right? So this is really, this top 100, it is who I am at the moment. Not much of it's going to change, I think. The top 10 will be pretty well locked, I think. Um, but it is who I am. Remember, remember my age, my influences as they are uh, by decade, one or two decades will take up the brunt of this list. Uh, you'll see, man. So travel with me as I take this thing on. Take it on. Let's start this thing. Hey guys, Rob from Georgia here with you, VHS 82 apostrophe. As we make ready to hit number 40. This is it, man. We're about to close in on what will be the top 25 of my picks for the best horror films of all stinking time. My time, at least. And remember, pre prerequisite, if there is a movie along this way that for whatever reason you think, how is that not in there? Maybe chances are I don't own it. That is a prerequisite. I must own the film physical media for it to be on my list. That is it. Also, Body Bags, we are starting July here. We just finished up Asian Horror Volume 2. And as we hit this first random week, Jason and I uh, thought uh, over at Horrific Nightmares, uh, thought uh, we would do an interesting thing. And uh, he would take one half of uh, a Screen Factory double feature. I would take the other. It is Amando de Osorio's uh, The Night Sorcerers. I think that's one. <laughs> in the nights. I'm pretty sure it's The Night Sorcerers. Night of the Sorcerers, and uh, the Lorelei's Grasp. And uh, so, respectively, Tuesday, Wednesday, those two will fall, and that was uh, that was fun. That was fun to do. Anyways, what are we waiting for, man? Let's go. Number 40. You see it up on the screen? Now, if you've never seen that set screen before, it is because that is my UK cut of the film at number 40 christian naibi who gets credit for director although this is a howard hawks film in through through in out whatever uh not so different than uh the story we always hear about uh toby hooper and steven spielberg on a movie we know as poltergeist but this is uh this is my uk and uh copy and um it is uh two disc and three cuts of the film, really. You get a uh, sort of a rough looking black and white. You get a uh, unauthorized color edition and you get a pristine looking black and white. Now you say, why would you bother going to the UK and getting something like that? Well, because this, my friend, boast of something very unique. And yeah, it is John carpenters you know that guy right he supplies the commentary track for this film on the rougher looking transfer of the black and white copy which is i think a little bit longer as he says uh i can't remember what edition he said something i think it's Can canada's uh release of it maybe but there, there's just a little bit more in there anyways if you know anything about john carpenter you know he star uh, studied howard hawks uh while he was at usc uh, he is one of his main guys and a huge influencer in his movies. If you watch The Thing and you notice one of the things in his 82 uh, film, The Thing, when you get, you know, 12, 13, 14 guys in one set, that's Howard Hawks, man. That's where he gets that from. But anyways, he paid money to be on this commentary track. He supplies the commentary and talks about one of the most, one of his most favorite films of all time. 
And man, I'm telling you, this is one of the greatest commentary tracks I've ever heard, hands down. Uh, and it helps that it's John Carpenter, and it helps that it's a solo commentary track. Generally speaking, solo commentary tracks are always better, whether it's Ridley Scott, uh, John Carpenter, uh, whoever it may be, your favorite guy. When they can just sit there on their own, reanalyze, revisit their own work without being encumbered by cast members, I'd rather, I, I would, look, if you can ever hear Ridley Scott's solo commentary track on Alien without the cast, that is an awesome, awesome commentary to listen to. But anyways, The Thing from Another World, 1951, Christian Nyby uh, at number 40. Man, I'm telling you, I have probably watched this movie more than any other movie in the history of movies. And it ought to probably be way, way higher on my list, but it's just sort of where it fell. Um, God, this movie, I love this movie in through and out i love i love this movie man um it just it, it's got some of the best dialogue uh it's the most natural feeling dialogue um that you're ever gonna run into man and howard hawks man his in, his, his imprint is all over this um i think i think he did it as a favor to christian ivy because christian ivy had edited uh a film for him because he was actually getting in trouble uh with another director for coming a little too close to someone else's material. Um, any, anyhow, let's stop talking about that. Uh, this was actually the very first review I ever did for Body Bags, going way back. Um, I'm probably, I don't know if I could ever stand to, I, I don't know, but it's the first one. Anyways, um, so here it is, 1951, number 40, Christian Nyby, The Thing From Another World. If you ever get a chance, man, look for this on Amazon UK. Uh, and specifically, make sure you're looking that it has the John Com uh, the, yeah, the John Carpenter commentary. Also, it was recently released on Blue. Um, not really nothing on there. Might be a trailer or something. And then, of course, the old snapper case. Anyways, we probably spent way too long on this. Let's hit number 39 from 1981. Another Sam Raimi film. Maybe the film that launched his career. I'm going to show off my Anchor Bay VHS. Of course, I have it on DVD and Blu-ray, but it is, of course, <sighs> The Evil Dead. Um, and I picked this up. So I got the whole trilogy, Anchor Bay VHS trilogy of this. This is one of my prized pieces of my collection. But I was fortunate, even though I, I caught it used at Second and Charles, uh, still had the book in there and everything, which was really cool. So from 1981, Sam Raimi. The Evil Dead, number 38, uh, Wes Craven, Shocker, uh, from 1972, The Last House on the Left. Now, I rented this bad boy when I was a kid, probably way too young to have watched this. Um, and I just remember, man, I remember being shocked out of my skull, man, when the, the uh, well, my childhood recollection, man, the, the sheriff, whatever is, comes in there right at the end of the, at the end of the movie, and the father's about to take the chainsaw on the one uh, leader of the group who, of course, they have killed their, uh, their daughter, and uh, basically turns a blind eye, man, and lets dad rip into him, man, and that man <laughs> left in him just an indelible mark on me, man. Um, throughout my all the years now i really do need to get another edition of this preferably that has the original artwork on the cover i really don't dig this um but and you know i'm pretty sure actually this was a gift too um so you know you never can go wrong with that right uh number 37 from 1975 let's bring dario argento back into the mix this is another rental from the old vhs days um and I remember just absolutely, I think it was known as the uh, Hatchet Murders. I think that's how it was released stateside because I'm pretty sure that's how I rented it on VHS. Um, this is considered maybe his masterpiece of a, of a giallo. Um, it may be. I really love this. I dig it. But there is a but. I, I actually enjoy uh, The Bird with the Crystal Plumage more, 1970. Um, this may be the better film structurally, mechanically, whatever. Um, but man, I'm telling you, man, it, 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 the, the reveals in here are so subtle. Uh, you miss it usually on the first, second watch, man. And, but when they're revealed towards the end and then you go back and you see where they are, 
dude, man, Dario was a freaking master. I'll just say it, he is a freaking master. And this this is one of his best efforts in terms of Giello. Um, Dario, man, and let's just credit Dario, man, because it, it, it was his quick rise that allowed him to be in a position as producer to get behind George A. Romero's effort in of Dawn of the Dead, which Dario gets to recut for European distribution, which opens up on the segue of what is maybe one of the great moments of Italian horror from 1979 with Lucio Fulci's zombie ending in 94 thereabout with uh, Michele Sauvé's uh, De, La Mor De La Morte, De La Mor. Uh, so, you know, Dario Argento, man, ought to be given credit, man, for basically ushering in the last great and the moment that most influenced people like me, man, as a kid going into the, the rental stores, man, back in the VHS heyday. All right, number 36. We just said his name, man, George A. Romero, another big rental man back in the day, although I always preferred Dawn. Day ultimately grew on me. And this Anchor Bay release DVD is so stinking awesome. Look at this, man. Look at this. You open this up, man. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that awesome, man? Isn't that stinking awesome? Um, you know, what can you say, man? I mean, people have their preferences, their favorites. Uh, and, and we'll never know what this movie could have been had George been able to realize his in, the entirety of his vision for this. Um, but what we did end up getting uh, is pretty stinking awesome, man. Really, Th this movie, man, has got so many memorable moments, man. You know, I mean, come on now. All right, let's bring some Peter Jackson to the mix. Number 35, man. And this is another one I rented as a kid in the VHS. I'm telling you, the VHS store, man, had such an impact on me, an influence on me, and my love for cinema. Um, you know, coming home on the weekend with three to five movies, man, to uh, chomp down on. Peter Jackson's, man, is 1992, uh, actually. Yeah, I always forget this movie's in the 90s, Dead Alive. Um, the, the practical gore effects in here are unparalleled. I'm just going to say it, man. This, this movie freaking rocks inside and out. Um, supposedly, he has said it himself, he is working on a 4k restoration of what i think he's going to call his early work so bad taste dead alive and maybe meet the feebles and they're supposed to be all released together i think as a box maybe i mean we can only hope right but he has said multiple times he is working on this right now and uh i remember i picked this one up on the cheap i, I could not believe i found this in a movie stop uh for like eight bucks man and at the time of course still is but i'm sure uh, going crazy money on Amazon if you want this copy. The artwork is is one of my faves from back in the day. And again, 90s. When you think Peter Jackson, Dead Alive, be truthful, man. I mean, you automatically think, I don't know, what was that, 85, 86 or something? No, 1992. <sighs> wow. Anyways, uh, let's get into some, uh, yeah, let's bring George back into the mix. And... Um, well, I was, yeah, never mind. Let's bring George back into the mix here for number 34, another movie that left its indelible mark on me early on, considered maybe one of the greatest anthology pieces ever. Creep show, man. And now this is my, uh, this is my UK uh, edition of the film and uh, sports the um, Just Desserts uh, documentary on there. And uh, I really even, had no idea how popular that documentary was when I actually got this. And when it suddenly everyone's talking about it, did you get your copy of Just Desserts? Did you get it? I went back and looked, I wonder, and sure enough, of course it was on here already. So, I mean, this is awesome. I saw this on the big, uh, on the big screen uh, as a double feature with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. And uh, that, was, that was so awesome to finally get to see this. Uh, of course, there's my ticket. Uh, see this on the big, big screen, man. Uh, my favorite episode in here? I don't know, man. I, probably I'm just going to go run, run with the crate. Father's Day is always fun, especially on Father's Day. Um, but I do dig uh, uh, the um, um, I can hold my breath. 
I mean, it, it, the whole thing is good. The wraparound, man, is great. Um, it, it's all good, man, with Creepshow, man. Ah, all right. Let's uh, let's bring in. Uh, yeah, we've we've mentioned his name once before, Joseph Zito. If you remember, number thirty-three, considered maybe by many to be the best entry post the original Friday the Thirteenth, Part Four, the final chapter. Um, what can you say? I saw this when I was a kid, man. Uh, this is um, yeah, this is nineteen eighty-four, so. I saw this when I was 14. Uh, yeah, that's weird. Saw Nightmare on Elm Street at the same time, uh, which was, um, yeah. So actually this was a date. Took a took a girl on a date when I was 14 to see this. And uh, I can't remember how much she dug in or not. Dude, I was, I was there for this. I wasn't there to be with her. I was there for this. I mean, how often can we say that as a guy, right? You go to see a movie, you got a girl with you, but you were there specifically for Tom Savani's work. You were there for some carnage. You were there for this. And I was there for this, man. And just to think that I got to see this on the big screen when it first came out is, is so awesome, man. It's so awesome. Man. Yeah, supposedly it's supposed to die, right? Supposedly. <laughs> yeah. We, we know we shouldn't always buy into that, but, um, all right. So 33, um, number 32, uh, I actually revisited this, uh, bleh, revisited this one last night and, uh, from John Landis, man. Um, I'm telling you, man, it's amazing when a director who does not involve himself in horror per se takes one on and knocks it out of the freaking park, man. Rick. Baker's work is unparalleled in terms of just uh, creating the effect of transformation. Of course, you know what I'm talking about. An American werewolf in London, man. Um, the, 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 the soundtrack, uh, just the cinematography, John Landis's direction, uh, the cast. Frank Oz is in this, man. That scene is so hilarious because all I hear is Yoda, man. That's all I hear is Yoda uh, when he's uh, when he's taught, he, he plays the U.S. ambassador uh, when he's visiting David in the hospital after that atrocious attack. Which that that even today, man, that attack is so it's so vicious. Um, I love the, the the sequence in Piccadilly Circus. Um, I love it, man. When uh, when Doc, man, when Doc's like, man. Uh, tells uh, David's girl, man, th there's been an there, there's been an incident in Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> it's werewolf it's just gone, man, berserk. I love it. I love that whole sequence, man. Uh, what sequences are not to like, though, man? Uh, when David and his uh, and uh, his buddy there uh, walk into the slaughtered lamb, dude, that scene is cut right out of the uh, James Wales, The Invisible Man. I mean, I mean. I mean, come on. And then there's a few movies that do a good job on that sort of walk-in entrance into a pub uh, like that. The practicals, the gore, uh, the transformational scenes that Rick Baker uh, supplies. Um, the end. I mean, you know, it, it, it is got to be considered one of the greatest werewolf movies ever made, hands down. And it sits at number 32 on my top 100. And at 31... Oh, I've said his name earlier, and we'll say it again, man. Toby Hooper, man. And uh, from 1982, the year I consider the greatest year for me personally in horror, hence VHS 82 apostrophe, uh, Poltergeist. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's always a lot of talk, man. Um, whose film is this? Uh, who, who deserves more credit? Spielberg, Hooper. But if you really dig down deep into some of the interviews, um, uh, I'm just thinking uh, it might have been um, Mick Garris. Mick Garris, you know, does that series. Um, he might have had Mosley and um, uh, Caroline. Uh, Caroline, what's her name uh, from uh, Texas, too? Um, anyways, uh, I think it was in that conversation. Um, it, it was pretty resolute um, that their understanding of the ins and outs of Hollywood and everything like that. Uh, this is, I, I've heard it said before, 
time and time again. This is Toby Hooper's movie. Now, Spielberg, like Howard Hawks, may have left his indelible mark upon it. It's hard. The opening sequence, it's, it's hard not to feel Spielberg's um, imprint all over this. And, and it does the movie great. But Hooper's imprint, man, there are scenes in this that are, that are, that there's no way Spielberg could have done like Hooper. Um, so I mean, maybe in the end of the, at the end of the day, it's a fine balance. And I wish we got more of these, man. You, you know, your Christian Nyby and Howard Hawks, your Hooper, your Spielberg. Um, it is. I would love to see another effort where you get somebody like. Um, well, we almost had it. Uh, Guillermo del Toro. Uh, in his project, he, his dream project at the Mountains of Madness, uh, adapted from an H.P. Lovecraft uh, short novel, had James Cameron be, you know, he had his back, man, as producer. Now, the studio backed out cold feet at the end, but this could have been another in the long line of, you know, great matchups of producer and director. In this case, I think Cameron would have let Del Toro just do his thing and we would have never had any controversy other than Cameron, such a big name, right? But it, these things, man, these, I think, great, great, great movies that go on forever um, are, are done well sometimes when you have a director who is allowed to uh, obtain as much vision as possible, but a producer that's willing to protect him. And I've heard it before that Spielberg protected Hooper's interests and kept the dogs at bay and really let Hooper do work. Um, and, and I think, you know, let me just say this too. This is a family favorite, man. Uh, not just my immediate, not my immediate family here, but like when I was a kid growing up, man, this is one of the movies that me, my mom, my dad, we all sat in the living room and we watched this so many, so many times. I mean, I can't even keep count. This was, if this movie were coming on TV or it was on HBO or something, I mean, I mean, pretty much everything stopped when this came on and we all got, we all sat down and chilled out and watched this, man. This was a big family event uh, to see Poltergeist. And I'm sure probably the first time it ever aired on TV, it was. Um, look, I'm not going to get too much into the film itself, but man, you know, we've all seen this movie a million times over. Um, it, it just, some of the, it's just the effects that go into here, the hands-on, uh, the camera tricks, man. Uh, when they're in the kitchen and she turns away one moment, uh, chairs around the floor, she turns back, chairs her up. That was one cut. I mean, that was one seamless cut. The minute the camera pans away, they rush in, set the chairs up, and then the camera pans right back smooth, and it's there. I mean, that's you gotta love that kind of uh, ingenuity, man. And uh, just uh, uh, the heightened score, on the, just the tension, um, I mean, I'm not going to go on. I think I see my time right now, and I'm just going to probably... Poltergeist, I think, is considered by most um, whore hounds as one of the all-time greats. I would hope so, because uh, it sits at number... Even though it sits at number 31 on my top 100, um, I consider it one of the all-time greats, uh, and one that you can really involve the whole family, uh, as long as your little ones aren't too little, right? So let's do this real quick, man. At 31... Hooper's Poltergeist at 32, An American Werewolf in London at number 33, Friday for the final chapter um, at uh, 34, Creep Show at 35, Dead Alive at 36, Day of the Dead at 37, Deep Bread, or you might have rendered it as The Hatchet Murders. Uh, Wes at 38 with The Last House on the Left. And 39, Sam Ramai comes in with his classic, The Evil Dead. Right. And of course, at number 40, man, probably the movie I watch more times than any other movie, man, The Thing from Another World. And remember, if you can hunt this, uh, this particular edition down that has the John Carpenter commentary track, it is so well worth it just to listen. Uh, to him go over this movie and it does open up uh, a better view into his work on his own 82 effort of course simply the thing um, so anyways happy July 4th man it is July 4th that I'm doing this quick video on actually it's not so quick but it, you know look I got three segments to go 
these are the ones that are going to be a little bit longer and i'm sure you can imagine why man because these are the movies that, that are coming closer and closer and closer to my heart man but i want to wish everyone a, a just a great fourth of july uh stay safe don't hurt yourself but have fun man enjoy it um enjoy the moments that we get that we can enjoy it right we always end these things off with go bills this is not a dream